Okay, so also um, thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to um, share my experience here. And also thank you for the uh, registered participants uh, that they uh, spent the time this afternoon. Um, we'll do our best to give them an interesting uh, tour through the nasal valve and some uh, surgical um, concepts. I want to start with the declaration of, uh, about my uh, conflicts of interest. I have no conflicts of interest. I have uh, no business relationship to the company of Kurz, and I get no compensation for the presentation today. Also, I want to mention that um, a part of the figures in my presentation is from an excellent article from Werner Hept in German about uh, valve stenosis. Coming to the first chapter, the anatomy of the nose and the diseases. So um, why is it so important to talk about this issue? Maybe you have been running in a situation like that. Septu the septoplastic was successful, but the patient is not happy. Uh, you take your speculum, you look inside the nose, you see the septum is perfectly straight. Still, the patient is complaining that um, he can't breathe properly. And uh, if you take a look at the face of the nose of the patient, you might see a situation like on the left side or the right side. You might see a situation that um, the opening is compromised uh, directly at the nostril or more deep inside the nose. And if you put your speculum in and you, you stretch um, the ailer of the nose, then of course you will not see this problem. So this is the issue of the nasal valve, and I will explain to you now what the nasal valve is. Um, it's a region that um, extends from the nostril to the nasal isthmus. Um, the inner valve is the caudal edge of the upper lateral cartilage and the septum and the nasal floor, of course. The external valve is the lower lateral cartilage, the ailer and the septum and the floor of the nose. And, uh, the isthmus nasi, so the inner valve, the most narrow part of the whole nasal airway. Uh, it has a uh, very narrow angle of 10 to 15 degrees between the upper lateral and the septum. You can see it also uh, from the side here anatomically that what are the regions of the inner valve and the, or the internal valve and the external valve. A similar concept has been made by Sam Most he called these two regions zone one and zone two, but basically it means the same. Um, the group of Hildebrand, Gubertritz, and Werner Hept uh, have made exciting research in 2013. They used uh, CT scans and some um, computer engineering modeling to model the airstream through the nose. And what they could show is that at the isthmus, there is 80% of the resistance of the nasal airway. And because it's so narrow then, the airstream is um, accelerated. So if we accelerate an airstream, then by the law of Bernoulli, there will be a negative um, pressure gradient of the wall. So the wall will be sucked in. And also it's important um, to keep in mind the law of hagen poiseuille that um, the diameter of a tube by the power of four uh, relates to the resistance. So small changes can have like a big impact. What is uh, the etiology of pathologies of the nasal valve? Um, mostly congenital or degenerative, meaning the cartilage is losing its elastic properties, its elasticity or traumatic or iatrogenic, especially after rhinoplasty. Mostly the cartilaginous framework is involved, sometimes uh, also the bony and the mucosa. Mainly um, contributing to stenosis of the, uh, of the valve are lower lateral cartilage, and the lower lateral cartilage is weak or malformed or malpositioned, or the upper lateral cartilage also weak or overlong or cranially rotated. Also, of course, Coral septal deviation, a narrow bony piriform aperture, a tension nose or plotic tip can contribute. So it's important now a bit to get to gain clarity where the problem of 
each patient's nasal valve uh, is located. You have to pinpoint it. I want to show you two uh, typical examples. Uh, in this young lady, you can see that um, the ailers are soft, that they are standing very narrow, especially if you look at the base view, you can see because of the short um, lower laterals, um, the columella is very wide. So this is called, oh, this is an external nasal valve problem. And this gentleman, you see this pinched area above the tip of the nose. Um, and in the basal view, you can see this uh, very narrow isthmus or inner valve region. And this is typical for a problem of an eternal nasal valve. What uh, diagnostic approaches do we have? Um, it starts, of course, with subjective ones, taking the history, uh, feeling the tip of the nose, um, and then look at the nose from outside you in breathing and ask quest the patient to inhale with force and to see if the ailer are moving in, if they're being sucked in. Um, also put an endoscope in the nasal vestibule, not a speculum that would stabilize the sidewall, but an endoscope uh, and see if uh, how narrow the inner valve is and if it's even collapsing during inspiration. You can also use a cotton swab or curette to pull the um, ailer laterally to simulate to the patient the effect, if, if this is what he is uh, disturbed of. Or you can uh, uh, use a cotton maneuver by pulling the cheeks uh, laterally to also widen the ailer. Objective method, methods are a rhino manometry with or without spacer tubes, four phase rhinometry, acoustic rhinometry, and if available or if anyway uh, existing, a CT scan or MRI scan. But you can see from uh, uh, the ranking I gave and the color I gave, the best um, diagnostics actually is uh, the clinical examination and your judgment. Um, no technical method can. Um, Give you such a clear indication about this problem. So this would be the first introductory part and uh, I would then ask Mr. Mertens if there are any questions so far. Or my colleague Avangen, Avangen if he has a comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I fully agree. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing this um i will touch on a few things again uh, afterwards so no questions right now thank you good well if there's no further questions then i would proceed with the uh, second point of the program describing the theoretic approaches to this issue and before we get into surgery there are still some conservative possibilities so if a patient has an allergic rhinitis for example and topical corticosteroids could be of help. Also, um, uh, formerly of a few years ago, an athlete were very popular to put these um, spreader uh, sticking um, band aids on the nose to create an ailer flaring. On the right side, you can see these um, uh, spacers who are put inside the vestibule, for example, at night to have a better night sleep. And even physiotherapy is possible in terms of that there are facial muscles who flare uh, the nasal ailer and you can use it to improve your breathing. But of course, you're talking about surgery today and there's a magnitude of surgical approaches uh, to address a nasal valve. Um, I categorize them in, in four groups starting with a very basic uh, straightening of the septum, going to the green box, um, contouring the nasal ailer and uh, narrowing the columella, light blue widening the isthmus, and in gray, some advanced rhinosurgery aspects. If you try to um, collect all surgical approaches uh, to the nasal valve, then you get more than 30. Um, and I'm sure this list is not complete. Um, and I will try to 
highlight some techniques, pick some techniques from each uh, category to demonstrate to you now. So first thing, um, don't forget the septum. Sometimes um, there are high septal deviations at, at the apex of um, the inner valve that just make the difference if they are still existing, if, if there is then a collapse or a stenosis. So um, be aware of the septum. Also look under the roof of the nasal cavity to see that. Um, and of course, if you have in the, in the basal of the septum uh, deviation like pictured here, then it's good to reposition it in the middle. Uh, on the right side, I show you this nice technique where you can drill a hole through the anterior nasal spine with a yellow injection needle to suture it in place. But coming back to the more specific methods, uh, the big block of the ala modifying and columella narrowing external valve maneuvers. Um, the first group I want to introduce is um, the procedures to strengthen um, the ala. And this is uh, three different um, strategies. The ala batten graft is a, a cartilage chip that is put laterally on the outside of the lateral cross of the low lateral. Then the lateral cruise strut graft is sutured on the inner side, so medially. And I especially like the, the modification of Holger Gassner, the so called stair step graft, where you uh, put two or three um, little cartilage chips here on the inner side of the, of the lateral end of the strut, so you can move it more to the outside and enlarge this angle of the nasal ala. Um, if you look to the middle, especially as I've shown you in my example, often you have like this short medial cross of the lower laterals and then a broad columella, then it makes sense to um, narrow the columella to increase um, the opening of the nostrils. You will resect the uh, depressor septinase muscle and make a mesh suture to the ends of the lower laterals. Show you an example here where I combine these two techniques. Um, first, resecting the depressor muscle uh, putting in a match suture, here you see from the side where the blue dot is, uh, where it is a suture. Then creating the stair step um, struts and putting them in place. And here you see on the table before and after, and you can see by combining these both measures on the outer valve, you can quite improve the opening of the nostril. Advanced rhinosurgery surgery addresses everything you do in rhinoplasty that can also have a positive effect uh, on the valve. First, for example, if you have a droopy tip, if you have a tip ptosis, um, also HEPT which was showing it with this uh, simulation that the airstream is then uh, deviated in a very unfortunate way. So if you lift the tip of the nose, patients also often report that you if I lift the tip of my nose and my breathing gets much better, you will improve the function of the nasal valve. On the other hand, if you have a um, high tension nose and you lower it, um, you will blunt the angle of the inner valve and thereby, thereby make it more stable. And if you do a lateral cruel overlay surgery to reduce a um, um, very projected tip, you will also tighten the lateral cruise of the, lateral, uh, of the lower lateral cartilage and thereby give more stability to the ala. So the final um, chapter of these four categories is now that the main topic of this afternoon, widening the isthmus or the internal valve. What is suggested here? First, uh, the spreader techniques, normally in the context of rhinoplasty. So what it does is if the upper laterals are separated from the septum, for example, because of a hump reduction, you do not just resuture them to the septum, but you put um, some um, cartilage stripes in between as a spacer if you want so. Modification of that is that during hump reduction, you don't uh, touch the upper laterals, but keep them intact and then just fold them in to get the same effect. Um, 
optically, this always makes or makes sense in many cases not to get to create a too narrow um, middle vault of the nose of the nose, but um, how good it works for the inner valve is a bit disputed because of course still here the um, upper lateral can curve in and not necessarily has enough stability to create a wide enough isthmus of the nose. Uh, three more techniques that are not related. I want to show uh, first the upper lateral splay graft. It's a modification of the butterfly graft um, where you take some cartilage from the ear and use it to increase the angle of the upper laterals. Uh, it depends on the elasticity of the cartilage from the ear and of course also has the same potential for bulkiness like the butterfly graft. Uh, flaring sutures here in the middle uh, is being used in um, rhinoplasty when you have already have an open approach then you can uh, make a matrix suture from one side of the upper lateral to the other side crossing the cartilaginous dorsum and if the thread is not cutting through here or cutting in here then you might create some opening of the upper laterals. In the nasal lift is an office-based um, procedure with barbed wire, uh, so-called barbed wire, uh, where you pull the upper lateral vertically um, to, the, to the bridge of the nose and create also some opening of the inner valve by that. Um, this thread is resorbable, so after one, two years, the effect is gone then. Something I find very useful in certain cases um, has been suggested by Weber from Karlsruhe, uh, the so-called partial, partial maxillectomy. Sometimes um, this, the lower side wall <coughs> um, of the maxilla is protruding quite um, into the nose. And then you can take a chisel and take out a piece of bone like roughly like one times one centimeter and the lower turbinate falls to the side. So as I said, in certain cases, it's a very useful technique. Um, finally, I want to show one technique I use as a fallback technique in cases I cannot use a breeze implant. Um, in Germany, it also has been uh, propagated by Werner Hept. Uh, what you do is that you resect like a sickle-shaped piece of um, cartilage of the edge of the uh, upper lateral, to be precise, of the edge of the scroll area, and then research uh, the mucosa over it. And by that, creating just this one, two millimeter space that might be enough, think of this Hagen Purcell um, law. Just an example from my operation table, you see here the upper lateral. Uh, here is the resection done, and here it has been sutured in place. And of course, finally, now making the transition to my colleague, um, the titanium implants, the breathe implant, um, is a method to open the inner valve, and that will be shown to you now in the next chapter. So are there any questions so far to this? Yes, there has been one question, um, which was, are there any typical findings in rhinomanometry in the nasal valve stenosis? Um, yeah, I, I mentioned, or I, I had um, this one possibility that you can do a rhinomanometry normally, and then you put like a short silicon tube in the vestibule of the nose and do the measurement again. And if you see then a, a, a clear improvement, that is an indicator that shows you that there's a nasal valve problem. I, I do have an extra slide showing. I had taken it out because I thought it's not so important I can show it. But it's at the very end. There's one more question coming in. Um, if you can explain um, upper lateral cut, upper. Oh. The cartilage splay graft. Okay. Just to show this rhinomanometry, so the, the green line would be with the uh, spacer tube inside the vestibule. 
where you can see uh, the red light is without it. As you see an improvement by putting the tube into the um, vestibule, okay? Um, then um, the um, upper lateral splay graft, yeah, it's uh, basically put over the dorsum, cartilaginous dorsum, uh, and then um, inside, underneath the upper laterals, so it's pushing them to the side by its own elasticity. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think that all questions. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mertens, for organizing this course. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wallner, for being part of the team. I very much appreciate that. It's great to see that uh, you and your patients profit from this kind of idea, which is not a new idea, <laughs> it's actually an old idea. And uh, we have a lot of work ahead today and um, I would like to start my part with the implant that is uh, 18 years old this spring. So we'll soon go into the 19th year of usage. So if any of the surgeons or of the uh, uh, people from the sales departments are confronted with that, it is really old and safe and we'll come to that. My disclosure is I do receive a royalty for my implants. I have 25 patents among them, um, middle ear implants, stapes pistons, and now also the uh, titanium breathe implant, of course. So we have heard this part of Dr. Wallner. Thank you very much and the previous techniques. And we come to an idea that is stability. Uh, we want a nose that is good for lifelong stability. If you look at these Angel's Bridge in Rome, that is several, almost 2000 years old parts of it, this holds forever in these bows. And as Dr. Van der beautifully showed before, the problem of nasal breathing is mainly in the lateral wall, in the internal nasal valve and the external nasal valves. Um, and the, the, uh, the valve itself, it's often de described as an angle. Well, the angle is only part of it. It's this three-dimensional space which contributed by the upper lateral cartilage, by the septum, by the turbinate, and so forth. So this is the isthmus, the most narrow part that we want to correct. And as Dr. Wallner beautifully said, the septum is the first step we should always take especially in the high septum. If you have a deflection towards the nasal valve area, the patient will always be unhappy. Even though you open him beautifully up below, he will come back to you and say, well, this side is not good. The other side is okay, but I can't breathe here. Um, the septal spurs, of course, if you can correct that, that's not a big part. Reduction of the turbinate is always a step in our surgery. So usually it's septoplasty, turbinoplasty. And then if we have to work on the lateral nasal wall, that's then the third part. Because the lateral nasal wall, as, as was said before, is the main resistor. It's the part that has been under estimated, undertreated, and the level of the internal nasal valve is rather high in the nose, and everything south of it or below it contributes to the external nasal valve. Now, it is not only a, a, a stability, a rigid stability, but it's a dynamic stability, which means if we inspire, if we breathe in air, if we suck in air, there is a tendency of collapse, and if we have a concave upper lateral cartilage or a weak upper lateral cartilage, that has the tendency to cave in, to fall in and make a nose more narrow because the lateral nasal wall, this is from a CT scan, you see the cartilages, this is the triangular cartilage, this is upper lateral cartilage, lower lateral cartilage, almost half of it doesn't even have any cartilage. So there is no support in this part. So what we must do is we must try to help this nasal wall 
uh, be as stable and as good as possible. Now, the patients often come into our office and say, doctor, I can only breathe if I pull my cheek aside when I fall asleep at night. So they do a spontaneous cotal sign, which has been known for a long time. The cotal sign, of course, stabilizes the external and internal nasal valve. So we cannot diagnose exactly where the problem is, but this is a clear sign that the patient has a problem. Or oh, they come in and say, look here, if I do that, I can breathe. If I, if I don't do anything, I cannot breathe. The push-up sign also stabilizes the upper lateral wall. Where is that darn internal nasal valve? From the outside, you can't really see it. That's a soap dispenser where you can say the, where the finger pushes on, that's about where it is. And when you look at the nose, put away the speculum because the speculum artificially uh, um, it dilates and makes the lateral wall rigid. We should only use the endoscope or if you don't have it, no problem. Just do, don't do anything. Just look at your patients from below, look into the nose and see what's happening with breathing. Let them breathe lightly, stronger, and very strong. And you see what's going to happen with the lateral nasal wall. And if you have an endoscope, of course, then you can put it in and see mainly the lateral wall collapsing. Now, if you see the collapse mainly up here, it is probably the internal nasal valve. But we have come to, to learn that if the collapse is more lateral or at the base or at the rim of the nose, then it's more of an external nasal valve problem. And then the breathing plant can also help, but maybe we'd also do something additional to that, like rim grafts or ailer batten grafts, but we get to that. So the valve collapse is a problem of uh, the older patients, but not only. There are patients coming in, uh, young, young uh, ladies, young men already with that problem. It's mainly in the noses that are high, soft, and of course somebody already has had a rhinoplasty, which often was a reduction and a weakening of the structure, and he is more prone of having a collapse, or she is more prone of having a collapse of the nose and needs more help. There is no um, statistics on, on how often this, uh, this problem exists, but if you look at your patients and you, you search for it, you see it much more often than you thought before. So look for that instability and a significant number of the population does have a problem in that area and needs help and has so far not been treated well uh, often. The problem is with the law of flow by Hagen Poiseuille that the volume that flows through a system where the most narrow part is here, it's the diameter exponential four. So if we only open that up a bit, it's already a massive volume increase for that patient because a valve is always the most narrow part of a system, be it in an engine, in the, in the heart or, or wherever. So, um, and what, what is happening if, if fluid or air go, flows through a narrow part, it is not increasing in, in pressure, but there is a decrease of pressure. Venturi first described this, or Bernoulli is the same, same uh, text. Uh, so this even has the tendency of sucking in the lateral wall more, making more of that collapse. So the main resistance is at least 50%, as Dr. Walner beautifully said, of the lateral wall. Here we see also what we call a recurvature. The lower lateral cartilage bends into the nose and needs to be dilated as well. So it's just logic to open that lateral wall and stabilize it. Now, in addition to what Dr. Walner said for, for tests, we very much like this uh, PNIF test, which is a mask like you would use in anesthesia with a measurement tool in front. It's uh, reusable, you, you can clean it, sterilize it, uh, and actually wipe it with the alcohol swab is, is already enough, even in corona times. And with that, you don't change anything of the anatomy of the nose, because if you do a rhinomanometry, you put in something artificial in the nose and you narrow the other side by that. So you, you, you change the the uh, airflow in the nose uh, quite significantly. With the PNIF, however, you, you will only push it on the face and then you can breathe in. The, the patient then must do a massive 
uh, inspiration at, uh, as much as you can. A normal is about 100 to 120 liters of air per minute being sucked in, which shows you easily. You do it three times and then you take the, the highest uh, measurement and that's your measurement for your judgment. Now patients come up with all kinds of uh, uh, ways to improve their breathing. That was a secretary using uh, paper pins and you know secretaries how they are sometimes they are a little bit wild in their ideas but for her it it worked and people sometimes come with tubes in the nose and say look this helps me to breathe but I don't want to wear these tubes or any nasal dilators the whole bunch of them now this uh, uh, Michael Jackson of course when he was a child didn't have a problem but he certainly became had a problem later on after his multiple surgeries of the nose now, who has, doesn't have a nasal valve problem? Probably children, especially with wide and flat noses, as in African Americans or these children. Uh, female, not so much, only if they have a high nose and a narrow nose. But then the Arab nose or the Middle Eastern or, or nose in Pakistan that we often see with a tendency to droop and being high and narrow, these noses are prone for a collapse of the lateral wall and they do need help to breathe better. And if you have an elderly gentleman with this kind of flaccid, soft lateral nasal wall, he is craving for help uh, to have his droopy, the nose grows as long as we live, of course, like the ears, they become bigger. Um, and the longer it gets, the more unstable this nose becomes. So if any of the young surgeons want to have an advice to start the surgery, pick out an elderly gentleman with actually a big nose, uh, so it's easier to see into the nose if you do the surgery, and uh, start the surgical experience there. Now, sometimes a patient comes into the office with actually a big nose, and he, he complains bitterly of not being able to breathe. He has been operated twice before, and if you look at him from below, you must always look from below into the nose, and you see that in the nose, this poor guy doesn't have an air, airway. He has septal deflection on both sides of the nose. He has a, a, a lower lateral cartilage recurvature coming in, filling in the airspace, and an instable lateral wall as well here, the, uh, the edge of the upper lateral. So these patients do need help. And if you think we came from this side, this is the right nose, to this with the implant of pulling it out, of straightening the septum, this is an incredible increase for, for him. He was a shoemaker and he was so happy he promised he will make me a custom-made shoes, but so far we haven't come around to do that. Patients who suffer from sleep apnea are often undertreated, underlooked, underdiagnosed. I urge any surgeon in any part of the world, go to your, your pneumologist department, talk to your colleagues, because they think the airway starts with the throat, with the uvula, and they look from there down. They have no idea what's happening up there. And the human being is a nose breather, not a mouth breather. So we need the nose, especially if we suffer from sleep apnea. So have those patients checked, get them into your office, look at them, and then you can help them. You will not be able to, to uh, put away with sleep apnea in surgery, but you will help them significantly to wear a CPAP mask so they can uh, survive the, no the, the night without tearing it apart and to have a better quality of life. And we see this over and over. These patients, sleep apnea, are so grateful for that. Um, go ahead and look for them. Breathe Right stickers, the sticker that is on top of the nose, of course, they do work. They work nicely. They pull out the soft tissue of the nose, but they have a tendency to harm the skin. I have patients coming in and say, um, even though they don't work anymore, they can't wear them every day because uh, it hurts the skin. They want a permanent solution. But it's a great tool to diagnose any patient, uh, whether he or she is a candidate for an implant. Now, what do we want to do? We want to, to widen a narrow arch of the nose with the septum in between, of course, to a wider arch, and not only wider, but that is stable. It doesn't actually need that much widening. Often, a just a stabilization in position will help the patient so it will not collapse in inspiration. Um, 
the nasal resistance obstruction is not so much in the septum. Of course, there are septal deflections that are significant. The lower turbinate needs also to be addressed, but at least 50% is the soft lateral nasal wall. And I'm sometimes frustrated also in my Switzerland, my country, when I talk to my colleagues and I tell them, look, give these patients a chance. And they say, no, it doesn't exist. I don't, we don't believe in that. It's long proven that this part needs to be addressed. And as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Wallner already showed nicely, the flow in the air from the vestibule is, is the most narrow, is, is limited by this internal nasal valve. When it passes that valve, it slows down in speed. But because it is so fast in speed, it causes that uh, Venturi Bernoulli effect of closing the nose. So if you only open that, that part a little bit, the patient will uh, profit. What is that part also anatomically? It is the junction of the upper lateral cartilage on the lateral part with the lower lateral cartilage. And this is what we call the scroll. And the internal nasal valve is not the nasal dorsum. Over and over, and we get to that, I, I talk to plastic surgery colleagues who say, well, I put in spreader grafts, I did something great for the airway. Nonsense. The airway is not affected by spreader grafts. Spreader grafts are for the nasal dorsum, but not for the sidewall. The sidewall needs to be addressed and stabilized, and that must be done. The nasal dorsum actually has this canoe-shaped uh, uh, upper lateral cartilage where the septum junction is together with the upper lateral cartilage and the scroll on the side here. And what we want to do is we want to open up that most narrow part, but not only in the nasal dorsum as we spread the grafts, but along the sidewall all the way down, because that's the part where the nose is the most narrow. And if we do decongestion, it has almost no effect on the valves. It opens up the no nose inside but not at the most narrow part. The middle vault, that's what we want to address, is of course this part, uh, it's roughly with the, the middle third of the nose. Uh, when I explain to the patients where will the implant be, I tell them, look, feel your nose up here where you feel the bone, that's hard. Then slide down and there where it gets soft uh, uh, for the first time, that's where the implant is gonna come. So it's fairly, high up in the nose. The patient will not feel it touching the nose, blowing the nose or doing anything up there. It is, it is rather high where the breathing plant is going to. And when we do rhinoplasties and mainly or many rhinoplasties are reduction rhinoplasties, we must be aware that doing osteotomies and all the rest of it, we reduce the airway in the nose. So even more so, we as nasal surgeons, doesn't matter whether you're facial plastic surgeon, whether you're maxillary surgeon, whether you're plastic surgeon, AENT surgeon, we have the responsibility for our patients to be able to breathe. And we must give them this, this uh, chance. And it, many patients also come in saying, my wife complains snoring, we have separated our bedrooms and we need the solution. And it does help for that too, not totally, but partially. So the idea of the breathe implant comes actually from the Breathe Right stickers, also the name we adopted from that, this metal uh, uh, rim over a soft tissue that holds open this, uh, this tent, and this is like, the, uh, like uh, the nose. Also, of course, this Breathe Right stickers is used in sports all the time. We don't see it that much anymore, but it used to be popular with football players as well. The butterfly graft also mentioned before is a technique that's very old from Oregon. Ted Cook uh, invented that where you take a piece of cartilage and uh, stitch it on top of the upper lateral cartilage to hold open, to have an elastic component of, of that. Uh, the drawback is it's rather thick and you will get a polybeak deformity and really nobody wants a polybeak. This is not a very good sign of surgery. It's actually the contrary. We want to reduce any kind of polybeak and give it a better nasal dorsum. So, but the idea is good. The idea works. And the, in, interestingly enough, in America, the butterfly graft is having a revival because it helps for breathing, even though it doesn't look that good. But people are willing to do that. 
Now, where do we come? Uh, 20 years ago, see 2001, already 20 years ago, I started in a brave way of using maxillary plates, rough maxillary plates that just are bent uh, as a bridge over the nasal dorsum, put two together, and it worked very well for this elderly gentleman, and that convinced me to go on with this idea. Then we used a, a continuous plate, not two plates, also still very thick, 1.5 millimeters, and also that worked well for the gentleman. So that is how we came up with the idea of having a implant that is very fine, very thin, but very strong. You cannot bend it in, in the fingers easily and the patient cannot bend it with his fingers as well. It's actually very, very light. I, I, when I have a patient in my office, I don't know whether you do that, Dr. Wallner, I give them one, one implant in the hand and say, look at it. And they always say, oh, it's that small. And then you can see how light it is, half a gram or a quarter of a gram, it's nothing. And it's very thin, it's, it's, it's half, half a millimeter of, of width. So this is half a millimeter of thickness. So it will never show in the nasal doors. Now for surgeons, there's one point I must stress over and over because this is the only danger this implant has shown over time is if it is put too close, too low to the lower edge of the upper lateral cartilage, because then the finger, the poking finger of the, of the patient might uh, scratch it open and it will be exposed. And when it's exposed, it needs to be re replaced. And if, if you say you don't poke your, your, your nose with the finger, you're lying. Everybody in the whole world does that, including myself. It is just a natural thing. We have this accumulation of dry secretions in the nose where the skin uh, crosses to the, to the mucosa and there it crusts. That's just a fact of life. Um, so if we put in this implant, do respect these two millimeters higher on the upper lateral cartilage, so this is avoided. But you see, this is on my index finger, how small this implant is. This is really very, very tiny. The idea is just as, as it sits, it sits on the nose like a saddle on a horse. You just, you put it on the, on the nose from up, up down. Now, unfortunately, there has been an implant uh, made of titanium with a coating of some uh, I don't even know what it is coated, PTFE, whatever, uh, in America. And the gentleman, Dr. Herbis, has a, used the technique cutting open the nasal dorsum and pushing it in in pockets without fixing it much. Now, the idea would work, of course, because it, it holds the nasal valve stable there, but the, uh, the, it, it has many mistakes. First of all, the approach is not good because it has a tendency to open up again and extrude. Second, if you don't fix it, uh, it, it will move. And anything, any foreign object in the nose that it is not completely fixed might come out. So the fixation of an implant is of magnitude, of importance. And this implant has given any kind of metal implants in the nose a bad story. So I, I, I'm fighting against this image for the, have been fighting for the last 17 years. Of course, also other implants, alloplasts, they, they come out in a significant part of, of numbers. And that is why many surgeons still today say alloplasts, Never in my life, not in my noses. We are natural, we go natural, we cartilage or whatever. And in my noses, it's only titanium that comes in and nothing else. And if you do it right, it has is proven to be absolutely safe and stable. So if, if your, your colleagues or, or, or anybody says they don't want metal in the nose, think about it. Metal in the skull is used in millions of people every year. Think about the dental implants, for instance. They are also titanium. They, they are in, a, in an area with a lot of bacteria. Think about all the maxillofacial plates or the skull base re, uh, um, reconstructions. So it, why shouldn't you be able to, to do something in the nose if you fix it well? Now, my dear friend, Yuri Rusetsky from, <laughs> from Moscow, he is a wonderful surgeon. And he gave me this, this slide where he reconstructed the nasal dorsum with two 
titanium plates that he he put together and 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 told me this gentleman has been stable for a decade or more as and and I, he probably still is wearing this this metal uh, reconstruction but of course we don't want that that is very rigid and there is a real chance that this could break through the skin now, breathe implant has six sizes from XS to XXL. If we use the implant also for other purposes than just the, uh, the, uh, the normal purpose on the upper lateral cartilage, we usually use the largest, and I come to that the, at the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, if, we want, if you want to find where, it's, where you can have it from, Kurzmate, of course, is the producer, and on the webpage, you can look for it. When you use it, please buy a set of sizers. Um, if you can afford it, buy all six. If you cannot afford it, buy at least every second one. So you can guess at least in between. Even after almost 1400 patients that I uh, operated on, I will never judge by eye uh, in the surgery, and of course never before surgery, what to use because it differs so much and every millimeter counts. So have a re-sterilizable set of sizers that you can use in your surgery. What is the difference? The difference is mainly the width in the bridge in millimeters. So it is uh, one millimeter between each size that it gets wider and also the flange gets longer towards the piriform aperture. Mm -hmm. Where is that implant located and why is it so safe in terms of skin? It sits on the upper lateral cartilage here in an axial CT scan and is fixed there and the whole uh, uh, skin over it is thick in that part. So on the side view, here is the implant. Sometimes it's a little longer and extends down to the piriform aperture, but that's roughly where it is. And patients usually can't feel it because it's mobile. They can wiggle it around. And only if I say, look, touch it with two fingers and try to feel whether it's a little harder, then they say, ah, yeah, OK, here it is. But before, they, would, they usually don't even touch it or feel it. Here in another CT scan, see uh, how in a reconstruction, how it sits on the dorsum and is actually quite small. If you look the size of, of the nose, it's not big at all. So surgical techniques, um, we discussed this first with uh, the, um, uh, what, what we should do first. And the, I decided to show you first the open technique and not the closed rhinoplasty technique, because it's, more, it's easier to understand the anatomy and the placement in the idea behind it. And then it's better for you to see the closed rhinoplasty afterwards. Dr. Walner will, uh, will start with the closed rhinoplasty afterwards, but I will come to first, start first with the open technique. This is important. Before a patient comes into the operating room, he has to be using a Bactrobran, Muperotin, uh, antibiotic uh, ointment into the nose for five days before. And um, this is important and not in the nose, but up here in the dome is where the staphylococci are sitting and residing and also other bacteria. And we want to get that, that nose as clean as possible before surgery and in surgery as well. So first, open rhinoplasty surgery. Mm -hmm. The open rhinoplasty, of course, you do an in inverted V or V-shaped or, or stair step, whatever incision you, you like. And the aim is to get to the anatomy of the nasal dorsum, where we see the scroll that we now by now know this is the most narrow part, and we want to widen that. So step by step, incision, preparation of the, this is from, from a cadaver, so it doesn't bleed much. <laughs> Um, this is the lower lateral cartilage, of course, Pitangis ligament. Then you can decide whether you want to preserve it or you want to cut it or you want to mark it and readapt it later, like Boris Chakir does, um, up to your liking. But on, in order to get to the nasal dorsum of the upper lats, you need to cut the Pitangis ligament. Then you use your pointed scissors and go onto the nasal dorsum gently and spread it until you see a whitish, silvery surface. You must be on that surface because if you're above it, it will bleed profusely again. So you want to be in that bloodless field 
uh, here that you can then prepare the nasal dorsum and once you see it, you can use cottonoids and swipe away the soft tissue there. Then you prepare the surface of the upper lateral cartilage sideways that clearly down to, this, to the piriform aperture. Um, I want to see the entire uh, surface of the cartilage in order to place the implant correctly and to see what I'm doing. Uh, in, the, in, in the connection in the scroll area to the, to the lower lateral cartilage, expect some bleeding. There are some vessels here that you must coagulate usually. There you see these vessels that might bleed profusely. So have a coagulation device ready. So you want to see the surface. You see this beautifully. Here is the septum. Here is the upper lateral cartilage, the scroll area, the connection of the two. Uh, the uh, lower part of the upper lateral cartilage in the piriform aperture that you can feel behind here. And of course, you do this on both sides. Then you take your sizer set and uh, try on the sizers. My first, uh, what I first look for is not below, but above. I look where the, the bridge of the sizer touches the nasal dorsum, respecting these two millimeters from the lower edge, as we have said before. And then the next part is I look how the flange, uh, uh, the point, towards the bony piriform aperture. Because they should not be, never be wider than the piriform aperture, otherwise you have a, a wide nose and the patient will complain about that. But as long as you are not as wide or just as wide as the, as the bony aperture, you're fine. If it's too wide at the end of your surgery, all you do is you take your index finger and your thumb and press on it until you have the, the width that is exactly the same as the bony uh, pyramid. So here we choose the size that we want to have, then we take the implant and place it on top. Again, those two millimeters higher than the scroll. Now we mark the scroll in this part so, we, so you see it better in this specimen. The first suture we use PDS50 now for, for 12 years I used proline 50 and actually had very little problem with that, but I've seen that PDS, the resorbable suture, works just as fine because soft tissue grows through all these openings and the implant will be stable after three or four months when the, the PDS is resorbed. So we usually start in the middle with the first suture, so it, we, we have the midline and we fix the implant there. If you have knots, uh, try to shift the knots into the opening so they are hiding a little bit in there. Next uh, uh, suture is we come from the side uh, with the needle. You can go through the surface or at, through the edge or even below the edge of the upper lateral cartilage through one of the openings there. It doesn't matter whether it's first row or second row and uh, it's just the same. You can also go all the way around and come back through one of the openings. That doesn't matter as long as you fix it. Now with one suture on one side, the implant has a tendency to rotate. Mm -hmm. This you see immediately in the open rhinoplasty technique, but you will not see it in the closed rhinoplasty. So there, after one stitch, you must switch sides to the other side. So here also we switch side after one stitch, go to the other side again. Here is the scroll, lower lateral, upper lateral. This is the edge and we can, you see, you can go in right through the edge the needle and the thread will never show in the nose, and even if they would, uh, there's no business. This will, this will not cause any harm. This will go away. Then we usually do at least three sutures on one side and, and pull that, uh, 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 that tissue up. Then we go to the other side again and have completed also with three sutures um, and fix the implant. And if possible, do the third one or even fourth one from the soft tissues laterally. So you also get a stabilization there from the lateral wall. As I said, it's, it doesn't matter whether you come in for the first row or second row and, and suture that. I once had an interesting information from a colleague from London, and he told me he was so proud he put sutures in all holes of the implant. Now that's an overkill, you don't need to do that. Three on each side is plenty. So here we are, this is the implant symmetrical uh, in the nose. And if we look with the endoscope a little closer again, you see now the, the edge of the upper lateral cartilage is sort of rolled up 
by the sutures, and this will prevent exposure from in the nose by picking by the picking fingers. Where is that implant? It's interesting. It's actually much higher than you think. It's not in the tip area. It's really fairly high in this gentleman. We marked it. Uh, it's, it's there uh, on that side. So what do we want to do? We want to widen the lateral wall, but not only on the middle part, but also the entire side wall to open up the airway. And what's happening here is from this cadaver that we just saw the surgery, he didn't have much of a valve collapse before, but nevertheless, you see the acute angle uh, before, and then afterwards with the implant, you get this pull up of the lateral wall. This is the septum, it's a lateral wall, and this is opening the valve like that. Now, the big difference to the emplasty of Lopez Infante, which works, I mean, Gene Kern has used this technique for 25 years and his practice is fine, is in the Lopez Infante technique, we remove tissue and actually make the nose softer and more prone for instability. In the modern rhinoplasty techniques, we always try to stabilize to make the nose strong, stable, and good for, for, for a long time coming. Here, by the way, you might see a suture below the mucosa, but you see even though we poked through the, the upper lateral cartilage, it does not come into the nose. Here, this gentleman on the other side, acute angle, rounded angle, and this is where the breathing goes through. We all breathe up into the nose with our nostrils being horizontal, then the air goes up. It doesn't go along the floor of the nose, but towards the, the dorsum of the nose. That's, by the way, where all the corona tests are being made. I, I'm suffering when I see the, the poor patients where they stick in the swabs like this in the nose. Of course, the swabs need to go back to the ear, otherwise they hit the middle turbinate and it's very painful. So inside the nose, you need to, to, to suture it watertight, not just one or two sutures as an aesthetic rhinoplasties, but needs to be watertight so there is no germs coming in there. And what is the effect it also has not only on the angle, but also on the lateral wall, the, the, it, it helps to correct the recurvature of the lower lateral cartilage that curves into the nose, makes the nose narrow. Now, not many surgeons, there are some surgeons, I must say, that have tried it and have used it and said, well, it doesn't work well, or they had complications. And here's one patient that I was sent to me by a colleague uh, and said, well, he put in the breathing plan, it didn't help much. Well, he didn't put it in correctly. If you look at it, he put it on the lower lateral cartilage and not on the upper, and he completely neglected the scroll and the effect it could have. So this patient just needed removal of that and put in the implant on the correct position. There you see the scroll and the edge of the, uh, the, the uh, upper lateral cartilage. And it worked well for him. You see this massive scarring. It was a multiply operated patient, very difficult case. Now again, steps, exposure of the nose, measurement, si um, implant in suture. And if you look from this uh, patient uh, picture to that picture, you see the amount of dilatation we can achieve. Now don't overdo. When I first started the surgery uh, 18 years ago, we, I, I, I chose implants that were almost too big so patients could see the implant. It's actually okay if, if we just put it in uh, parallel to the bone and so it will not show, it will work very well just like that. You don't need to dilate it. Maybe here it was almost too much dilatation. And again, PDS50, use a P3 needle. This is a stable needle, not any other, because that, will, that helps to, to go through the cartilage and it will not bend, a P3 needle. There you see, oops, there you see the implant on top. You can do septoplasty before or after. This does not harm it. You, of course, do your aesthetic rhinoplasty before and usually do it afterwards as one of the steps later on in surgery. Then you resuture the lower lateral cartilage to its normal position. In general, the lower lateral covers part of it, but it doesn't have to. Some noses, uh, the lower laterals are shorter, or if we do a cranial resection in aesthetic refining of the tip, of course, it will be smaller and, and that's okay. 
But in, in this case, for instance, the contact area that the implant has with the skin above is even very slow. Inside the nose, it's dramatically open. See how wide this nose has become and how open it is. In this surgery, um, you see a, it's an old surgery, it's an old tape, I apologize a little, the, the quality is not that, that uh, good anymore, but at least you can see the steps. Clean the upper lateral with the cotinoids that you can see it well. Choose the size. Here we used retractors. You don't, you should not use retractors, otherwise you, you, you display the, the valve artificially open. Choose the size. As I said, the bridge is important, that the bridge fits on top here, that it's not too wide and it's not wider than the piriform aperture. The two millimeters, then you start the suture in the middle. Doesn't matter, first row, second row, you go through. You can have one or two sutures in the middle, that is uh, up to you. One is usually enough. Then you go to one side, and you see you go right through the edge of the upper lateral cartilage that uh, uh, will not show in the nose. There is some bleeding in the corner. That's where you need the coagulation. Oops, here I did two on the side, uh, uh, other than I just told you. Well, in an open rhinoplasty, you could, but in a closed one, you should switch side to the other side first, so you don't get a rotation. On the other side, you, you have the needle holder backhand to your liking. Again, go through the edge of the cartilage. And all it actually is, it is a reinforcement of a natural structure. It's nothing else. It's a very thin structure, titanium, 0 0.5 millimeter. It never shows in the nasal dorsum. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get through in the lateral part, so be patient. And then at the end, you see how stiff and stable this is. If you push it on one side, the other side comes along. So no... Uh, sucking in of air, then you put in your struts or whatever you want to do with that surgery. And the inside, of course, you see how much widened it is. Here in an open rhinoplasty, for instance, there uh, you see at the end of surgery, this patient has received spreader grafts. I love spreader grafts. I'm not against spreader grafts, but spreader grafts are for the nasal dorsum, not for the lateral wall. One has to understand that. So we can often combine that and you see here we need a dilatation and stabilization of the upper lateral cartilage as well. And this one, here it's sutured in and you see how, how rocket stable this is. You can lift the patient off the table almost holding the implant. It will not move anywhere in the world and that stays lifelong. It will not come out through the nose, through the skin. It doesn't, it's not possible, it will not move. Right here, uh, again, in a patient we, um, at the end of surgery, the spread graft is in. Here we actually used a titanium plate, and we get to that later on to strengthen the septum and combine the spread grafts with the breathe implant. So it's the best of both worlds. Nasal dorsum, beauty, structure of the dorsum. Spread grafts are actually structural grafts. They don't spread. Visually, they spread the, the nasal dorsum, but they don't, don't spread the airway. It's a misconception. Uh, and laterally, we spread it, of course, with the implant. So um, um, I would be ready to hand it over in terms of closed rhinoplasty to Frank Wallner, uh, but I would be happy to answer your questions first, if there are any, uh, Mr. Mertens. Yes, we have um, two questions. To clarify, is the implant sitting caudal to the piriform aperture, or is any part overriding it. I'm not sure if I... Oh, yeah. Um, almost never the implant overrides the piriform aperture. Uh, it would be a very small nose and you would use a very big implant, say an XXL or XL in a short small nose where that could happen. But in general, it does not extend over it. It doesn't need to. It's not like a strut graft or a batten graft that needs support from the bone, otherwise they don't work. 
but this has an elasticity in itself. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question. Would you use the implant even if you open the middle for it and put spreaders? Is there going to be um, a link where um, the, the um, people can see these important pictures and tips again? Um, maybe I start with the last question first, and yes, we will um, we will put this video, the whole course, um, on the web page, and all participants will receive an email with a link where they can see it again. But the first question, Professor Aveng, is going to to you if you would use the implant even if you open the middle fold and put spreaders. Of course, like I just showed, if it's necessary, if the indication is there of the instability of the lateral wall, absolutely. Um, those are the cases of aesthetic rhinoplasty. Of course, there you want to be careful not to make it too wide. But I, I tell the patients, look, um, the, you will have a impaired breathing if, if we don't do that, but I will make sure I'll use a, an implant that just follows the contour of your nose and you will not be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question from um, Mr. Beckus. How often do patients postoperatively narrow their own implants by squeezing of the nasal dorsum? And how easy is it to widen and adjust the implant width in the office? To widen, I never do. Mm -hmm. To make it narrow, you need force. Um, I set the patients in the, in the seat if I, if I want to do that and tell them, look, it's going to be painful and I have to press pretty hard. And then I use my thumb and index fingers on the nose and I have to press really hard to make it more narrow. And this is because it's painful, the patient doesn't do that himself. I've had patients who come in and say, look, this bothers me. I can see it a little. Can you do something? But I would not dare. Usually uh, there has been an implant in the nose also by the Kurtz company, which is not on sale anymore, thank God, it was the bruises implant. And that bruises implant was a, a, an implant uh, subcutaneously on the external nasal valve that where the patient could narrow it or widen it. And that is nonsense, that was nonsense in terms of, of, of metallurgic uh, uh, problems. It, it caused the, the breaking of the metal, that the metal will get tired and will break. And the breathing plant, you only narrow once, maybe twice, but not more. Now, one detail, I've had some patients who have the implant and play football, soccer or whatever, and get a blow to the nose or an elbow or a fist or something, and the implant might be bent. And the patient comes in and you will see that you have a, a hump, a new hump on one side, usually it's one side. And what's happening is, the implant that stands like that curves. So that's, that's happening because the end, the flange of the implant with the blow pushes against the piriform aperture and then it bends to the side and it will be curved like that. So if you see that in the x-ray, you need to take an x-ray. If you see that in the x-ray, uh, take the patient to the OR in local anesthesia, uh, expose the edge, use two uh, tweezers, two, two needle holders, and bend it straight again. You don't need to replace it. I've done it several times now, it works well, but that could happen. Thank you. There is an, um, two more questions. Um, is there a possibility to camouflage the implant with fascia temporalis above the implant? Um, but I think normally it's not necessary, or? It's absolutely not necessary because the skin is there, the nasal dorsum, it, as I said, it never ever shows on the nasal dorsum. If it would, then, it's a, then you have placed it in a wrong position with the edge up, but it lies flat on the torso, so it does not show. You could. I mean, we use, we use free dice cartilage. You could use fascia, temporalis fascia, whatever, for the nasal dorsum easily. You just combine it. That's fine. Okay. Now the question is dropping in massively. So um, which disinfection you suggest before putting the implant? In my OR, we use octenicept. Mm -hmm. and, and I show that in the closed rhinoplastic technique, it's really important that uh, after the, the sterile dressing of the patient, that you disinfect the nose before you cut the hair and after you cut the hair to have a clean field of surgery, especially up here in the dome of the nose. Octenicept, but whatever you have, you could also use betadine, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
Another question comes, um, if you have reports of CV infections or other complications, but I think you will come to the results afterwards, or? Yes, we'll talk about the complications afterwards, but I can say already now, the rate of infections is absolutely minimal. If you, if you follow these, these, these disinfections techniques that I described, um, in, in my first um, 15 years of implants, I didn't even use antibiotics in the surgery. And then I had one, one lady who developed a, a, um, a subcutaneous infection uh, of the a massive phlegmona of the skin in an aesthetic rhinoplasty. She also had a breathing implant, but the infection came through the, the lateral osteotomy into the cheek. And there she needed a massive antibiotics afterwards, and that forced me now to use prophylactic antibiotics in the OR as a single shot, cefuroxime we usually use. But as I said before, 15 years, we didn't do anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I, I also use uh, cefuroxime as a single shot. Okay. Yeah. Another question, I guess I know the answer. Um, is there, um, do you have cases where multiple implants will be used for widening the valve and extra stabilization? Yes, we do. And I will show you some more cases afterwards towards the end in tips and tricks. Um, that is the beauty of this implant. You can use this as a tool. It's, it's a tool in a toolbox that you can use for your, with your imagination as long as you follow the rules of fixing it and make sure it is not mobile and, and going anywhere but where you put it. Mm -hmm. And as long as it does not touch with an edge the mucosa itself. It always needs a cover of cartilage, uh, so the, the, the metal should never touch the mucosa directly. The last question for the moment is, um, is there is a kind of titanium mesh or kind of very, very thin mesh used for bone graft or in dental implantology, which can be used for the same purpose? And the question additional to that is what will be the, I guess it means cost for each implant. The last question we can answer from Kurt, that's certainly different from market to market. And we would um, um, ask you to get in contact with your distributor. Um, unfortunately, we cannot see from where this um, the question is coming from. But the question is um, about is, is, is a, a thin kind of mesh that could be used for the same purpose? I would like you to answer. Not really. A mesh is soft and is, is pliable. If it has an elastic, elastic property, it might work. It could work. But the, the secret of breathing implant is, of course, that it is so stable, so rigid. It's actually very hard. If you take an implant into your hand and try to bend it, you're surprised how stiff this is. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the mesh is probably softer. And with the mesh, I would also be worried that the edges are, are, are raw, are hard. And the breathing implant has all smoothed edges as all the implants of the Courage Company are treated beautifully on the surface. I have to give them credit that they are really the masters of implants for the ear and the nose. Thanks a lot. That's what, what we would like to add as well as um, every time you, you're cutting titanium, you create extremely sharp um, edges. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's much easier to use a, an implant which is simply made for that. So that's all questions at the moment. Just one, one remark to all participants. Please be so kind, use the question function and not the chat. If you use the chat function, there's a high risk that we um, will not see the question. Okay. I'm curious to learn from Dr. Walner. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, I, I will start um, first with my my perspective on when to put in the breathe implant, and I, I named it choose wisely, do's and don'ts. Um, and for me, the indication is the narrow internal valve and the collapsing internal valve. Um, I to come to the counter indications, I always ask my patients. How, is, how do you feel about a permanent foreign body inside your body? Um, and um, most of them say totally fine uh, as long as my problem is solved, but there are some that are hesitant or they say, 
Um, I don't know. And in these cases, I rather refrain from putting it because I'm afraid I, that after some time they might ask me to take it out again. Then I have um, a bit experience with um, young patients with extremely thin skin of the nasal dorsum. Uh, where after implantation, I will come with the results to it later on, I, the implant could be seen and they, in the end, they requested me to remove it. So in this case, I would um, not put in breathe implant. Also, of course, as you already mentioned, martial arts athletes who get uh, regular punches on the nose might be not the best candidates for it. And of course, um, you should not try to correct a, a massive collapse of the external valve with the breathe implant. Having said that, um, I show you my internal approach and I want to do it with a bit of painting. So you can see here uh, the lower ledge of the upper lateral of the scroll area and uh, I cut above this region like that because um, as Professor Wang uh, had shown, if you make a transaction here, uh, what you have is you have the upper lateral that scrolls up and the lower lateral that touches in here. And if you cut here and you put your implant like that, then you have this cartilaginous uh, protection around the lower edge of the implant. This is very important. I'll just have to erase that. So. Here you see the uh, incision being made. It's uh, uh, the classical um, intercartilaginous approach in, in closed rhinoplasty. So you look at the outer surface of the upper lateral. Um, here the implant is in place. I, I also very much agree with uh, what has been said about uh, putting the sutures alternately uh, uh, on alternating sides because you get this rotational effect. And then if you just suture on one side and then you swap to the other side, then they don't see uh, the leg of the implant anymore because it has been rotated most likely upwards. And uh, this is then when it has been stitched up, I also do use a, um, many um, single knot uh, sutures to meticulously close the vestibular skin so nothing is uh, lying open. So that would be my view or my point uh, on this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Then it's my turn again. Um, the closed rhinoplasty technique, I started after about five years. All in, I guess in, all, in my first five years, I did not dare. I was doing all open rhinoplasties. And then I, I thought, why not uh, do it uh, um, in a closed technique? And it's actually well possible. The approach is called transcartilaginous because we cut through the cartilage of the lower lateral cartilage. And as uh, Dr. Walner just said very nicely is we cut through the um, lower lateral that bends uh, comes into the scroll. So the implant is protected above, as you can see in this uh, depiction. Now, step by step, I, I uh, uh, took some, uh, um, I made some big pictures for you to take a look. My first step in, in this surgery is always, I suture the tape or the cloth to the upper lip. And I use a proline 2O with a big needle. And I come right through the lip out and do an interlocking suture. Um, so the cloth or the cover never opens to the mouth. Now I've heard some aesthetic, some, some plastic surgeons say, oh, they always want to see the teeth. So they know what midline is for the nose. But um, in general, we do that beforehand to, to see where the spine is, where the axis of the nose is in aesthetic rhinoplasty. So I don't need to see them out. For me, it's much more important to keep away any kind of bacteria in there. Next step is copiously um, disinfection, especially in the dome with the octanicept on a cotton swab. Uh, then I, I cut the hair. 
Usually then this is done with scissors, but I've learned the technique with a blade, a 15, I now use a 15C blade. This is a smaller 15 blade. And I suggest to all you surgeons out there in the world, change whatever you do in the nose with the blade to the 15C. It's so much more precise and so much finer to do your surgery. So I cut the hair with a, I have a needle holder, a, 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 a scalpel holder with a round grip. So I can easily rotate it in the finger and I, I pass on the skin. You have to, to, to stretch the skin very much with the speculum and then you scratch it so it will not bleed like a butcher, like, like a barber would do. And at the end, you have a very clean surface. Uh, and then you need to disinfect again because with the cutting of the follicles, you might get more bacteria in the nose again. So again, thoroughly uh, uh, disinfect. Then I always mark this uh, area, even though I know where to go and what to do, but I like to mark it uh, usually first with the hemitransfixion incision of the septum and then going above laterally uh, with the incision of the transcartilaginous. And these two to three millimeters is what we, what we want to keep. So don't go into cartilaginous as we would for an aesthetic rhinoplasty, but slightly above and go further lateral. You need to go to the, to where the, the, the lower lateral cartilage comes down to that edge. So this is wider than in general in an aesthetic rhinoplasty. See there, it, it comes down uh, really more lateral. On both sides, mark it. And then um, I also mark on, the, on one side a, hemi a, a, a full transfixion, but only in the upper third of the nose. There I want to get through. So the tissue is mobilized on the nose and I can push it sideways better to see the nasal dorsum and to help for my surgery. Not a full transfixion, but only the upper third. All my incisions in the nose I know now do with a monopolar needle that is isolated. This is beautiful because it does not bleed anymore in the nose, almost not. You see, you cut in there you, along the edge of the septum, you prepare along the septum and then let afterwards you go around it, have a suction of course in the area so you, the, the, the fog, is, 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 uh, the smoke is sucked away and you see better. Do this on both sides. And then you start your septoplasty, and after you have finished your septoplasty, then you address the nasal dorsum. Use your pointed scissors, and it's the same as in open rhinoplasty. With the pointed scissors, you point down, and you spread, and you try to find that silverish, whitish surface below the vessels of the dorsum. What also helps is to use a cottonoid to sweep away the soft tissue. Also, this is, a, this is a wonderful tool if, if I do a mobilization of the skin down to the nasal uh, um, root all the way to the glabella, I use a blunt uh, cottonoid tip and sweep away the skin so we have a, a cleavage, a level of cleavage without bleeding. Don't use knives or scissors or anything like that. But you need to be prepared. This area can bleed. There are several vessels going around the cartilages that you might have to coagulate. I have an insulated monopolar coagulating suction coagulator from Valley Lab here, whatever you have, or if you have the bipolar, that's, that's good as well. We are here on the left side. It's there you see the next step then is to be on the surface of the upper lateral cartilage. Identify that, make a pocket, but not all the way, but just a pocket big enough so you can slide in a cottonoid as a space holder um, that sits in, in there. So here I put a cottonoid into that space and that will protect the upper lateral cartilage from injury when I cut the lower, cut, the lower lateral cartilage with the monopolar needle. Uh, then I use a small double prong hook, attach it to the soft tissue there, pull it out, and only then I will use the monopolar coagulation, uh, monopolar needle to cut through and expose it, and the same on the other side. Um, this is the incision with the monopolar needle, and then, we, uh, then the tissue is mobilized, so we have a connection through the, trans, uh, the, the, the connecting part of uh, transfiction in the upper third or upper half of the nose. 
You then see the nasal dorsum, the uh, upper lateral cartilage that come together here with the septum, of course. This is the, the, the rem remnant of the lower lateral cartilage where we went transcartilaginous in there. Now expect again, expect some bleedings down there, so be careful to coagulate that, but you need to expose or you need to prepare the pocket all the way down to the piriform aperture. Don't spare any part, you need that to see well. Afterwards, take your sizer and inside, ins slit it into, into the pocket. It's a little bit more difficult to see, but with a little uh, bit of training, you can see that you see how wide it is on the upper part, how wide it will be on the lateral part to the piriform aperture to, to be at this correct position. Then this is important again to against uh, infections. I always rinse an implant bed with octenisept before I put anything in. I also rinse the skin and the vestibule again, so we have a minimal amount of bacteria in this area when we take the implant from the box and then slide it in. And I like to slide it in sideways so it will not touch or it will touch the skin at least with the least amount possible when we put it in there. And there you see the implant in, in its position and uh, immediately you can judge how much space we will gain for the airway where we see where the upper lateral cartilage is sitting and where we want it to have it. And the suturing is then the same with, through the edge of the lower lateral cartilage through the implant on the st one stitch on one side, then go to the other. Otherwise it will rotate too much. Maybe sometimes you need to pull it down into the correct position again, and then you suture uh, the other side and then slide the, the knots if possible into there so they will not uh, be exposed. Complete the other side. And the beauty is the, the tissue uh, injury is much less than with the open rhinoplasty and also you're much faster. Uh, a septoplasty, turbinoplasty, breathing blend surgery takes me between 1 hour 15 and 1 hour 30 for everything. Again, the important edge that we want to preserve is that cartilage edge that helps that the implant is not exposed into the nose. And also, I like to readapt this edge with the upper part again, so we close that transcartilaginous incision. The effect, of course, is exactly the same as in open rhinoplasty, the opening, widening, rounding of the valve, the lateral pole of the lateral wall. There you see that safety stitch. The safety stitch um, also with the PDS 5.0, I start inside now, so the suture head is inside. Wherever you start a suture, that's where your knot is going to be. So you start inside out through the the uh, lower lateral cartilage on this part, and then you connect it to the other part, go in again, tie a knot, and then cut the, the, the suture short. And this will pull together the lower lateral cartilage and is for safety. This is why I call it the safety stitch. And then watertight closure again with a Vicryl Rapid 5.0 or whatever you use in your operating room. And the effect, of course, is immediate. Um, if you don't do turbinoplasty or septoplasty where you don't need packing, you can leave it open like that without packing and the patient will wake up with the nose opened and freed and he will hug you in the recovery room because already then he has a better breathing than ever before. Here on the other side, you see the acute angle of the, of the valve that is now widened, rounded and opened. This, by the way, is a video that you can look on YouTube. Just put in a breathing plan, then you find the closed and the open rhinoplasty techniques there, and you can get some information from that. Questions, Mr. Mertens? Yes, a couple. Um, the first one is, how do, do you measure the size of the implant in the closed approach? Just the same. Yes. <laughs> The next one is uh, to Dr. Wallner. What is your opinion about spreader grafts in relation of nasal valve improvement? Yeah, as I said in my presentation, I think it is rather limited because it, uh, the spreader graft, of course, it, it opens the apex a little bit, but it has no influence on the stability of the sidewall. So they might still be narrow, still curve, and still be sucked in. Thank you. 
Um, that has been all questions for now. Okay, then we continue. Complications. Now, clinical outcome, I thought we start with complications because that's the, always the questions that, that uh, you get asked if you, if you start a surgery as a young surgeon or if you are a distributor and you need to be able to answer that. Complications are not often. I, in my first 100 patients, I had four patients where the edge was exposed because I did not take care of putting it, uh, as I st stress so much now, uh, in, onto the upper lateral cartilage. Uh, and then it is exposed in the nose, and then, of course, you have to take it out. It will heal without any problems. You could potentially put in a new one uh, if the patient wants to. But that has taught me that it needs to be uh, set there, and then ever since, I have not seen this. I have, the, I'm, I'm always challenged with the surgeons who say, well, any foreign implant in the nose will come through the, through the skin. No. If you suture it well and it, it, it sits there correctly, it will never get out through the nose. I have not seen it except one single case in 1,386 patients right now of an elderly lady who passed out, fell flat on her face, broke the nose and also bent the breathe implant. And she had very thin skin. And unfortunately, the, the, she broke open the skin on that part. But is that, is that the problem of the implant? It could also be the bone that could break through, through the skin. That's not the problem of the implant, that was the trauma. And uh, we removed it and fortunately this has healed well, it left a little scar, but she was happy. In fact, the old lady later on requested to have an implant back again because she liked the breathing. What I've seen a, a, a few times is a granuloma formation in the area of incision of the lateral wall. And when I looked at it, it was the suture end of a proline suture sticking out. So this was a surgical problem of sutures not being buried correctly or had left it too long and that was poking through the skin of the vestibule causing this granuloma. Uh, I, I cut the suture, disinfected it, coagulated it and within two weeks it was gone. So that is, but do, do take care that these, the safety sutures you start inside so you'll never have a suture coming out through the nose. But the stability, the long-term stability in the nose is at least that number, 98.5%, as far as I know. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there might be some patients who went to other surgeons to have their implants removed. I accept that. There are some people who psychologically cannot accept it, that they have a foreign body in their body, uh, in, in their face or wherever, and they just want to have it out. Even though it works, that happens. You all know nasal patients are among the most difficult patients to please, and a good number of them has BDD, a good number has neurological, psychological problems. So we have to deal with that. Uh, but the safety, we can say in these 18 years, I've seen one perforation, I've seen endonasal perforations, I've had a couple of patients where the, the skin was red afterwards, and we had to remove it because the patient felt it was, it was giving him swellings and maybe an allergic reaction, even though the titanium is supposed to be pure titanium without any nickel or other alloys that could cause that. Um, the, rarely, very rarely, there is an allergy to titanium, but it's really rare. And some removals in the first part, but as I said, overall, the stability has been good. And over and over, I'm now in my practice since 2002, my private practice. Patients now come back after all these years and say, you know, I come from a hearing problem, whatever, la, la. by the way, that surgery that you did to me 15 years ago, 18 years ago, was the best decision I ever made in my life because this has changed my life to the good. So they are really very, very happy with that, I can tell that. Safety precautions, again, um, Bactroban for five days, uh, resorbable sutures we use now, Octenicept um, copiously, watertight closure, and uh, perioperative antibiotics. I don't give post-op antibiotics. So I think it is good and true to say it is safe. We don't have to scream anymore. Um, this implant works. It has proven the test over time. 
I've had a Swiss colleague who said, well, we have to prove it over 70 years. So we wanted to have a study over 70 years. Well, the patients have to live that long first before we can do that long term study. But 18 years is good, I think. Anyway, the effect it has now coming to the effects of for the patients is pre op post op. You see this lateralization of the lateral wall and the recurvature problem that is also corrected somewhat. Um, Nowadays, I would go to the lower lateral cartilage and cut it there and, and have some tissue removed sideways and, and place it there again with a couple of stitches so it will help it further on. But nevertheless, the nose gets cleaner. Also, the crusting in the nose is less. Why? Because whenever the air is, is turbulent, we have an airspeed that is three times as much as in laminar airflow. And when it's fast and turbulent, it tends to dry more. And once the airway is open, the, the flow is easier, it's more quiet, and the crossing is less. And here is an inter interesting um, observation over the years. Again and again, patients come and say, you know, actually, I have a severe hay fever. I have a severe nasal allergy. And ever since you did my surgery, that has significantly improved. I need less medication, less, less sprays, uh, and so forth, less antihistamines. Because once you open the nose, the pollen and whatever is, is the irritant can flow in and can flow out without being stuck. And the same is true for infections. Regularly, my patients come and say, doctor, since I have the surgery done, I have almost no, no rhinitis. I used to have uh, an infection of the nose every three to four weeks in the winter. My nose was blocked in the winter. I suffered from sinusitis, from frontal sinusitis, whatever. Ever since, that has gone. And this is probably the same. The, the, uh, the, the virus can flow in and out of the nose without being stuck in the mucosa, without causing this infection. This is my theory. I have not proven it. It's not scientific, but it's an observation that you will see over and over again. Um, again, we have seen where the, the, the plate, the, 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 the implant is, and you can combine it, and we get to that, we're using the implant as a splint for the septum in various indications there that works beautifully well. Okay, now um, it's time to take a little coffee rest, um, but no, let's go on. We, for the first five years we did a study, an anonymous study of all consecutive 100 patients that we asked in a, in a mailing and the turn back was two thirds, which is good for a mail in, mail out of, of, of anonymous patients. And the results were interesting. The patient's age was mainly around the middle age. So it's not the very young, not the very old, but mainly people in full work capacities that were suffering the most. It was two thirds male, one third female. The question we ask, how wide does your nose feel before and after surgery? You see always before is blue, afterwards is magenta. Uh, a significant uh, change of the feeling of width in the nose from very narrow to very wide. How is the quality of your sleep before and after surgery? Again, here an improvement of quality of sleep to good, very good, neutral. Some were not so improved, but you see a move to the right. Now, there has been a worry that the nose would get too dry and you would have more crusting, more problems if you open up the nose. There was this, this curious um, scientific work by Professor Milinsky from some years ago that said you have to have a narrow entry of the nose in order for it to have a normal turbulent airway, or fl airway flow in the nose. I disagree completely. If you open the nose, it don't harm the breathing or, or, or the, the humidity. And as you see in this one, it's just the same. The nose doesn't get drier. Actually, you get less crusting in the nose. Snoring. Snoring, you cannot um, give guarantee to the patient. And I usually say, look, what will happen is if you can close your mouth, you can breathe through the nose at night sufficiently, you probably snore less or less loud. The, the, the uh, loudness of your snoring will be finer. Maybe your spouse will then be able to sleep with you again in, in the same room, hopefully. I never give any guarantees because we know snoring happens in the throat, in the velum, in the, in the back of the tongue and so forth. And that's, that's there. But 
An open nose is the first step of treating snoring. If you treat the snoring by cutting the uvula, I don't think that is very, very brilliant to do. Uh, and also the question, can you have your mouth closed or do you breathe with the mouth? This is significantly improved, of course, much less mouth breathing, less dry mouth. They don't need to drink water all the time as they are doing before. Do you feel the implant? Um, some feel it. That was in the phase where I used them, them a little bit big. I tend to have them smaller now. So some of them could feel it, yes, rarely, or some felt, no, they couldn't feel it at all. Today is mostly, no, they couldn't feel it at all. Does it bother them? No, it really doesn't really bother. Only one patient said, yes, it bothered them. As you said, there are always some cycles around. The external width was about the same in a, in a majority uh, or slightly wider. Some felt it was much wider and then we can press it closer together, as I said before. How do you accept the way you look? Uh, does it bother? No, it uh, bothers much, bothers little, neutral. It's actually good or very good, neutral. Does it help in sports, in breathing? Oh, yes, of course it does. I mean, if you want to make cyclists happy or, or cross-country skiers, people who do long-term sports, runners who run for long distances, if they can close the mouth and breathe through the nose at least part of the time, you give them an improvement of their quality in sports. Did the quality of life improve due to this surgery? And if so, how many steps? Some said it did not improve, but a nice part of the patient said 72% um, yes, it improved, and they gave these steps how much it improved for them. And that is also shown in another Dutch uh, paper that was uh, uh, printed in Rhinology in 2018. And the most critical question at the end, did you profit? And I ask every of my patients for quality. When the, before, I, before they leave my office at the end of the treatment, I want to hear from them, did you profit from this surgery? And you cannot have a good result over a long time in all your septoplasties, turbinoplasties. We all know it's frustrating. Many of them come back. Many go back to their general practitioners and say, oh, the ENT doc did my nose, but you know, half a year it was good, now it's bad again. We hear this over and over. If we help the lateral wall in a five-year uh, question anonymously, 90% is an excellent number. You can never make everybody happy. And also the second question, would you recommend it also? nine out of 10 would recommend it to their friends and families to do so. And I have implanted part of my personal family as well. And I see them, I see whether it works for them. And they, uh, they report to me as well that their allergies are much less. They have less infections. They profit tremendously from it. Mark Bloching uh, from, uh, the, he was in Halle at the time. He's now in Berlin, of course, a dear colleague. Also did an early study uh, three years after we started it in his patients. And he found the patient's attachment of cosmetic results excellent. And in uh, the nasal obstruction, much improved, the same as we saw. And the snoring, uh, the same improved. So this is absolutely parallel to what we have found. Now, can we help patients with nasal obstruction? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Unfortunately, so this uh, nice gentleman is not in office anymore, and we have suffered four years and hopefully going to the better now in America. Yes, we can. Am I biased? Of course I'm biased. Goodness. I mean, it's like your child. You think your child is the most beautiful in the world or the best in school or whatever. Of course, I'm not free. But ask the colleagues that do it. Ask Dr. Wallner. Ask anybody who has done the surgery, whether it works for them, whether it works for the patients, don't ask me. Because our patients tell me for them it works and they support it and they suggest it to their friends and they come back again happy and uh, yes. This gentleman, a dear colleague from London, for instance, Mr. George Fayat, came early on into my operating room, by the way, everybody of you watching is invited to my operating to a room anytime, free of charge. Just call us, see our program, come in, join me. You can also wash in, you can, we can do the surgery together. I show you all my tricks. He came to me early on and he has been active in this field and he wrote this 
in his webpage, and he tells me he uses about 12 implants per month in his patients. That's what, 120, 140 implants a year. That's, and he is, his patients are as happy as mine. So if you say you don't find patients, search for them. You'll find them, you'll have them, and you have a happy clientele. Now I've put together a number of questions that come up when, when you deal with, with breathe implant and the titanium implant that, that I want to, to answer. So maybe you could have, have to ask less on the, on, the, on the chat there. I do mostly aesthetic rhinoplasty. This breathe implant would not fit into my practice. Why? If you're a plastic surgeon, you work on the nasal structure, on the nasal dorsum, you make beautiful noses. Generally, you don't work on the septum or the turbines. Maybe you do an out fracture of the turbines, fine. But in order to secure the airway of your patients, you said, because you're right there in your closed and open rhinoplasties, you are there where this little thing goes. And it is just such a little add on with a tremendous effect for the patient. And as I said before, whenever we do a reduction rhinoplasty, never ever compromise an airway. It's just not done, it should not. I see patients operated on by plastic surgeons. I'm not against plastic surgeons, I have many friends, who, but who did not care for breathing. And they come in with small noses and they cannot breathe. And then we have to help them and open them. Well, this breathing plan might work, but I don't see the patients for it. You don't look for them. Go out to your colleagues, your general practitioners, to your pneumologists, go to the, the CPOP lab, go to, to them who treat nasal obstruction, uh, who treat uh, uh, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and you have tons of patients. And you can, you only find it if you look for it because you have not been looking for it because you did not have a good solution. It's human. When, when we cannot treat something, we don't want to, to wake up a sleeping dog, right? But we can treat it. Metal implant in the nose, never in my hands. I hear this over and over again. Tell them, look, 0 0.5 millimeter width, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 grams, uh, milligrams actually, not grams, milligrams. It's completely immobile. It's fixed, it will not move. And Gordon Su uh, from, I think he's from Hong Kong, once said, implants that are mobile, like nasal dorsum implants that they use in Asia a lot, they come out because they're mobile. And once they're mobile, they can break through the skin and they can open up. Will breathing blend lead to an empty nose syndrome? No, never seen, uh, absolutely not. And the concept, as I said, by Mlinsky is not valid anymore, where you need to keep the mucosa high in the, in, in the, in the head of the turbinate. Actually, I, I go below the turbinate, below the mucosa, remove all the bone of the turbinate and part of the lateral wall and flatten it, but keep the mucosa intact. So I don't resect any kind of mucosa of the turbinate anymore. Um, and the opening of the airway does not lead to crossing or dryness. Would my patients accept this septanium implant at all? It depends how you talk to them. And I, I heard uh, some colleagues say that they ask the patients, well, here, here we have this metal implant titanium. It could help you for breathing, but we also have the natural cartilage that we could use for you. Do you want the artificial part or a natural cartilage? And then of course, everybody says, well, I want it natural. I don't want an artificial stuff in my nose. Of course, if you ask it that way. But cartilage is not able to do the same. Spread grafts don't open the nose, period. In what aspects will my patients profit from that? Well, they will have a better nose lifelong. And I prove that, I, I promise that to you personally. They will sleep better, hopefully snore less. Uh, apnea, it might be less, never a treatment against apnea, but for CPAP mask wearing, better tolerated, yes. Sports, less infections, actually less allergies could be put in here as well. So there are multiple aspects why a nose can get better. This valve problem is not frequent. Why learn a new technique? You have not seen it, you have not looked for it. It's underdiagnosed and undertreated over and over. What if my patient feels that the nose is too wide now? Wait, I tell them all my patients wait, three months at least, wait until the swelling goes down. 
And then if it's a problem, as I said over again, thumb and index finger on the nose. If you have a very sensitive little lady, you can put a local anesthesia in it so it will not hurt, but in general, uh, they support that. This is too expensive. No, what uh, the surgery costs several thousand euros or francs or whatever, the dollars now. This is maybe about 250 euros and it will save you time and they'll give you happy patients. Uh, the question is who pays for it? And I do hope that the, 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 uh, the number of the cost can be also be reduced by the company. I talked to Mr. Mertens over and over about that because I see in some countries they say we cannot afford it, which is unfortunate. We all, all the patients in the world could have access to that. And, and I also ask the distributors, keep the price as low as possible, then your surgeons will use it. The, the companies with the best prices are the most successful in the world. IKEA uh, um, is, is a Walmart. Those are the most successful companies. So keep it low in price and you have large numbers. Where do I find the distributor for this? Go to courtsmed.com. That's easy. Is it reimbursed? Yes. In England, uh, George Fiat did an audit and it is fully reimbursed. And until the British NH system <laughs> supports something, it must work. And let me tell you, otherwise they would not, no, would not pay for it. In Switzerland, almost all insurances pay for it. There is one insurance that is renitent and they even today say it doesn't work, which is useless. I cannot discuss them with anymore. Uh, they are just not brain dead, I'm sorry to say. Who should learn this? Well, every rhinoplasty surgeon. If you are in able to open a nose in a closed or open technique, learn this technique, put it in your armamentarium. Does it give signals in the airport metal? No. It's pure titanium, no, no iron in it, and it is so, so small, so light, it will not. Is it reversible? Can, can we take it out again? Of course. You could. Local anesthesia, remove the sutures. I have to warn you though, usually the soft tissue grows through the openings quite substantially. So you need to cut the whole surface with your 15 blades free until you will be able to, to take it out. Can I choose the correct side before surgery? I have some colleagues who say, well, I have a male patient, so I use an L. No, absolutely not. The size depends on the nasal dorsum, not on the size of the nose. And we really don't know how wide the bridge is. Actually, the biggest noses sometimes have the thinnest bridge and the smallest noses have the widest bridge. So maybe a petite nose of a, of a lady might use an XL and maybe a, a big tension nose of a male might only need an S or, or even an XS. So you need to have all sizes ready in your OR and you need to have the sizers to do that. Um, if I, but what I, what I do also is I ask the patients, what is your preference? Is your breathing your main interest if you, if you want to breathe maximally? I use an implant one size larger than I would measure. So it's one millimeter wider. You might see it one millimeter on the side. Is that okay with you? And if they say, perfect, I have my snoring, I have my sleep apnea, I don't care, I will do that. Fine. If they say no, I have an aesthetic rhinoplasty, I don't want anything seeing it, so we just take the size that the, 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 the nasal dorsum has already. Is this a difficult surgery? It is a standardized surgery. It is easier than, much easier than an aesthetic rhinoplasty, which is very difficult, we all know. And a septoplasty is sometimes more difficult, a reconstruction of a septum or a correction of a septum is more difficult than that because with a breathing plant, it's the same every time. It's just the same every time. It's actually boring as a surgeon. How do you explain it to the patient? Well, tell them, I'd give, if you have one, uh, I wish maybe the company Hermeatens could give some surgeons some of the, uh, of the implants so they can have it and show it to the patients and give it to the, in their hands they, so they see how small it is. Tell them you slip, put it in through a slit in the nose in the close rhinoplasty and they should not feel it. Now there are several other studies around. One of them, an interesting one, was from uh, Latvia, from Riga, Professor Bogdanova did this with pretty much the same uh, results where they used the nose scale to evaluate that. 
pre and post aesthetic results that the patients were pleased, even in females. And I would also use it in thin skin patients, Dr. Wallner. Even in female thin skinned, I'm not worried at all because it does not, never shows on the, on the dorsum, really doesn't. In their statistical analysis, they got a success rate of 93%, even better than what I said with a 90% in their patients in the NOSE score, which is validated. So I would say bluntly, it is the most reliable way to open the nasal valve. It works, proven, period, it works. Here, here is a, 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 a paper that I would suggest to you to look at, 2018 rhinology, the best paper for rhinologists in Europe. This is from the European Rhinological Society and Vandenbroek, who I don't know, I have no relations to that group, I don't know who this is, wrote, they, know, they called it the titanium butterfly implant and the effect of the titanium butterfly on nasal patency and quality of life. And their conclusion, last sentence is, it is one of the most effective surgical tools for nasal valve repair in patients suffering from nasal valve insufficiency. Right, questions. Thank you very much. I would like to, to start with one comment from um, Maria Pulido, who's saying that um, he can't more agree because um, he's a rhinology sur surgeon who works a lot with sleep apnea patients. And um, by doing mainly nasal function reconstruction, aiming to open up the valve area is almost a problem in every patient. So I think that's very good feedback from that side. Yeah. We have several questions. Um, I think the one first has been discussed partially. Um, how often have you seen infections with these implant? Almost none. Really almost none. Infection is not a problem at all. If we do it in a clean surgery, the way I described it, infection is not a problem. Maybe I, never I, had, I, never, I don't remember that I had one patient that had an infection of the nose with an implant, but she had a fascia lata. From, from, a, from a dead body, and that got infected. And then she thought it was the implant that got infected, but it was the fascia that was put in that, that had some, some bacteria on it, but not the implant. But what, what is Dr. Wallner, what do you say? Have you seen infections? Okay, yeah, I was, just wanted to, to, to share my um, experiences also. I have not seen any infection. I have, as I said, roughly 90 um, implantations done in the last eight years. I have uh, similar counts, what you say in terms of uh, removing it. I removed two because it was a young lady and a young man who said, okay, they can see it. It's disturbing them aesthetically. In one case, um, I had uh, um, a younger lady also, she had the trauma, like a, a trauma from the from the bottom, so like compressing the nose and afterwards so the vestibule tore open and the part of the implant was lying open, though it was not infected, I removed it. Mm -hmm. And on her wish, I put it in six months later, a new one because she liked the effect of the implant so much. So that is uh, also a similar experience regarding complications like you have. Uh, in, in general, what I get as feedback, the patients I see back is also and mostly very highly pleased. That they say it's a, a very good effect. They have better breathing, better quality of life. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one participant is asking about the, the use of the implant as an l strut and, and we as Kurtz have to make a comment about that. Um, we know, Professor Aveng, you do that, you use the implant for that purpose, but please have in mind that the breeze implant is not registered and not approved for that purpose. So if you do that, we know it probably works, but it would be off-label use, and that's important to know. So we cannot, also not in that, that symposium, um, show how to do it, because that would be legally problematic. Oh, I had planned to show that. <laughs> I can think about part of it. We'll show it off label use, okay? Are there any more questions or is there? Is there... there are more questions. There are more questions. Yes? The next question is what is the percentage worldwide, if you know, of um, titanium plates uh, used for nasal valve improvement? I think there are not really clear numbers available, but I think um, percentage wise it's pretty low, I guess. 
what plates you use for the nasal dorsum. I have no idea what is used. Um, you would have to tell us how many implants have been sold over 18 years, several thousand. I mean, I personally have used almost 1,400. So I guess several, several thousand. I have no idea of the total number. Yes, it has been several thousand, but we don't know how much percent that is because we don't have a overview about all the procedures worldwide. So I guess because it's a very common procedure, I guess percentage-wise is pretty low, I guess. Yeah. Um, somebody's asking, what about the term sensitivity? I'm not sure whether it's referred to the... Oh, good, good, good question. I've had this question from Russia before, where it's of course, where they have cold temperatures. Um, a patient with a breathing implant will come back and say, I have a cold nose. And they are worried, or I am worried too, that the metal might get cold. But what happens aerodynamically is, once you open the nose and cold air is allowed to, to pass through, they can suck in much more air than before through the nose, and that has a cooling effect. And of course, the nose feels colder afterwards, but it's not due to the, the implant. The, the implant is so deep under the skin that it will not become cold and make the nose cold. It's the cold air. And the treatment is easy. Use a shawl or something in front of your face as we now use the COVID masks and they, uh, that we also feel the, the warmth there. So use, use something in front of the nose. But the implant, I don't see a problem with the cold air. We use it in cold Switzerland in skiing. So that's, there is no issue. Mm. Thank you. The next question is, I think you answered it before, but uh, maybe again, if the measurement set is really needed. Mm -hmm. I think yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I think you mentioned that, that um, if there is a cost issue, I mean, the sizes are not really expensive, but if there is a cost issue, I guess, if you at least have every second sizer, that should be quite, quite yes. helpful. Yeah. Yes. The next question is, do you think that rhinoplasty preservation techniques jeopardize less nasal valve? Yes, um, that has been proven. <clears throat> Once you lower the nasal dorsum with preservation of the T of the septum and the upper lateral cartilages, and you splay it open with reducing the height of the nasal dorsum, the valve has an opening. And that is, that is good for the nasal valve, yes. Mm -hmm. good. That will help. But nevertheless, you might still have some, some collapse. And I do preservation of rhinoplasty as well, and I still combine it, if needed, with an implant. Okay, next question, would you, um, you both, would you recommend to start with the open approach and then after experience um, go to the closed approach? Dr. Wallner, what is your opinion? I think that would, um, would be uh, um, recommendable, yes. Yeah, I think it, it is easier to see the anatomy to understand and at the placement, and once you are you are uh, you are comfortable with that, then you can go to the close one. Yeah, I if I do implants, uh, and I only do closed rhinoplasties now. If I don't need to do a tip plasty or something. The second last question is: Does the implant work on high deviated septums, or is the septoplasty important um, to do it before? I would always do a septoplasty before. Uh, that's if, if you have a septal deflection, a high septal deflection towards the, the valve, even though you open the valve somewhat, I mean, you still have a high septal deflection. And if you can, can correct that, it will help the patient. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I am, we had about 20 questions. The last one is, um, what was the, the coming out of your coffee that you have shown, Professor? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, well, well, we got it apparently, but we, uh, we will go on before we get to that coffee, uh, uh, if I may, because there are some aspects, we almost have an hour left, some aspects I want to discuss with you that are important to my heart. For instance, this lady, she came to me and said she had a, 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 a rhinoplasty otherwhere, another place, and she cannot breathe. And what this surgeon did, he overdid the spread grafts. And surgeons must understand where the cartilage that we put in the nasal dorsum will end up. Because I had, I've had colleagues say, oh, I was very good. I put in a big, big uh, spread graft. Nonsense. <laughs> you shouldn't have a very small spread graft in top only touching the dorsum and not extending into the nose because that makes an obstruction. 
the spread grafts was made as a reconstruction of the middle vault. Jack, she never intended breathing. It was to avoid the inverted V deformity that was so common at the time when there was only resection and no reconstruction of the nasal dorsum. So widening of the nasal dorsum uh, corrects the, the inverted V and gives the you no know, stability and structure and the beauty, beautiful um, eyebrow tip line that we want in aesthetic rhinoplasty. But it does not spread the airway. It's a mis misnomer. It's a structural graft. It's a structural dorsum graft. Because what does it do? Usually the, the implant that the spread graft that we put in is not quadrangular as everybody in, in papers point, uh, draws it like that. But in fact, we, it, it is rectangular, it extends into the nose and it ex extends along the dorsum. It touches the valve, which is this part laterally on one little point. And it is maybe one millimeter wide pushing this a little bit millimeter to side, but it has no effect on the lateral wall. In, in contrary, it can have a paradoxical effect by pushing it out, it can crave in the inside, and then you have not gain, been gaining anything or you have made it worse. So this one point touch is, is where the spread graft hits the valve. So if surgeons say, oh, I did something wonderful to the airway, I put in spread graft, you are, misleading yourself, you are not measuring what you're doing because it's not working that way. We need to improve the, the upper lateral cartilage stability and, and location in the nose. Look at that. The, the, the anatomy of the nose is beautiful, this double arch like McDonald's, where the septum merges into the upper lats. There is actually a French colleague who says the upper lats are part of the septum. They are not one, they're not they're different entities. This is one cartilage. And this beautiful bow with airway, what do we do? We cut it here and then we put a spread of grafts in here and we suture this flat. But look, the loss of airway with that, see? And, and with the suture, you actually compress the upper lats together and might narrow it even more. Hopefully not, but it could happen. That is why I use spread wraps all the time, if for the right reason. What I try to do, I try to keep them short in height. So they're not extending into the nose. I try to keep the wider part in front where the valve actually works, where it is, and the thinner part in the back. And then I try to have a suture that is just barely touching the upper lateral without compression. I was taught to do big stitches all through the five layers coming out, inside out, and pulling it together. That's nonsense because then you pull together the upper lateral cartilage and we want to preserve that elasticity for breathing. And often I do this, see? See that the spread graft is not high here. I, I combine this again use the, the implant, and there you see the room for improvement. That we then pull up, and that is the airway that the patient will get. So the spread graft does this, the implant does this. Or here, a, a patient who came with a narrow nose in the valve area. Well, when I dissected it inside the obstruction, that was a, 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 an implant, a spread graft, taking it out and putting in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the release, this is what opens the airway. And this is the measurement we did before and after uh, with the spread graft versus breathe implant and improvement with the implant. No wonder. Or this patient, she has had a rhinoplasty by a surgeon in Switzerland before and she was very unhappy. She so see they had this inverted V deformity, collapse of the middle third. The tip was too wide, it was too thin in the middle third. She was really not happy. That is her afterwards. What did we do? Opening it up, you see all this scarring, the difficult surgery, exposed the nasal dorsum, and there I used the spread grafts to widen it in front, see more than in the back, and use the implant on top of it, the best of both worlds. And that is her before surgery and after surgery, where we have now a nice tip. You can do all your aesthetic work that you want to do in the nose. There is no hindering in there, and a stable lateral wall. And that's her from the side there. You don't see the implant. The implant would be about in here. Mm -hmm. So in an aesthetic rhinoplasty, we take the, the thinner part so it will not extend. 
This lady did not have a surgery before, but she wanted to have a reduction of rhinoplasty, but she also had a weak lateral nasal wall that had a dynamic instability that would collapse in inspiration. And then what, what I did on her is use spreader flaps. Now, spreader flaps you can only do if you reduce height. And I don't understand sometimes at conferences, colleagues say, well, I sometimes decide whether I should do spread the flaps or spread the grafts, and then I do this or do that on the, on the patients. But the truth is you can only do spread the flaps if you do a reduction of rhinoplasty, otherwise it doesn't work. But what, if you do that, then you put your sutures on there, uh, that will compress the airway with the implant, at least you hold open what's left and stabilize it in that way. Here you see the sutures. Also, I've come away from doing the sutures going through all five layers of both upper laterals and the septum going all the way through because that compresses it too much. I, I now do a suture only coming from the inside layer, going parallel, going out uh, through the septum in the other upper lats, parallel and going out again. So it's a mattress suture, U-shaped suture that only holds the inside of the upper lateral and not compresses the whole thing. And then on her, uh, in combination with the implant on top, measured with the sizer that you can do just the same and see, uh, this is how you've seen it. This is her at the end of surgery, nice tip, nice stable lateral wall, good breathing. This is her before and after. So now this is off label use. Uh, Mr. Mertens, maybe you want to have a coffee or so um, because we want to, I want to sh at least share what I'm doing. You don't have to do it, but I share what I'm, and we are also working, I can say that in, with the corporate company courts, we are working on an implant for the septum and that should be out hopefully for clinical testing this year. I say this every year because I've been working for seven years on that. So I do hope it works this year uh, with medical regulations. The problem often is that we have a septal deviation that is high going into the valve area that is very difficult to, work, to correct. Any rhinoplasty, septoplasty surgeon knows that. So what do we do? We take the largest XXL breathing blend, bend it in the hand, then it's not, not flat usually. So we want to have it flatter. We wrap it into a, into a gauze, both sides, hit on it with a hammer on both sides and flatten it that way. See, it's now flatter. It doesn't need to be perfectly flat disinfect it again in octenicept and then use it as a splint. And this splint, it has helped me over and over again in difficult septums, in fractures, in, in uh, reconstructions, in spreader, uh, extended uh, spreaders, uh, um, also in, expand, in septal extension graphs, that's what I was looking for. You see this bend of the nose here in front that you can score, you can do whatever you want, you don't get this straight. With the plate, it is straight, perfectly straight. Here we also use spreadographs on top. You see that I like spreadographs and we breathe and plant on top. You cannot com easily combine them. See, splint here, breathe and plant there. And these are strong and stable and flat septums in my place. It is great, it works great if you have a fracture that is difficult to reconstruct if you do not duplicate the cartilage, but we all know duplicate cartilage makes narrow nose. So we want to avoid that. Or in extracorporeal septal reconstructions, we can use it as a splint. First choice, of course, is always the perpendicular plate of the nose. I agree with, uh, with the Stuttgart group, of course, but if you don't have it, then you can use that and you can use several. I've had patients where I use two implants in the septum for that reason. Where it works fantastically well is in the extension of the septum with a septum extension graft that is public, uh, made popular by Rick Davis from Florida, where Rick puts it side to side, which makes it narrow and puts it out of the midline for the patient. If you put it end to end, it's usually too weak, but with that plate, it works, it holds. Here is a Thai boxer, martial arts uh, man who stopped his career, but wanted to have better breathing. His nose was shattered, it was broken. He had four layers of cartilage besides in his nose. So we need to reassemble that part and put it back together. And it gave him then uh, for the reconstruction a septal plate on top, uh, a breathing plant for breathing 
and he, this is him pre and post op. Pre and post op, he still has a little hump, but he didn't care about that. Here is a septum that was, has had only had remnants, and I warn you, that's really edgy to do, but just to show you when you are desperate and you, I, didn't, I couldn't take rib graft from him, uh, that we put in two uh, um, uh, flattened splints together as a U-shaped and put it in the nose and increased the, the breathing there. And this is the patient after surgery. I've recently seen him. He is now three or four years out. He's stable, he's fine, he's good. So um, where can you use it in the septum when, it, when you have bent weak cartilages, where you need to have an extension, where you do extracorporeal work? And we also published this. So uh, this is not only off-label, it's now also uh, published that it works fine there. But after this series of 30 patients, I saw one patient where he, this, this patient was digging in his nose with his finger and was able to break open the mucosa and expose the implant, and I had to take it out. Fortunately, by then, the septum cartilage was healed, and it was stable afterwards. But he would also have uh, uh, brought open the cartilage. So that was also not the fault of the implant. It was a technical destruction of the mucosa by the patient. And in a, in a cadaver, uh, I, I want to show you this upper uh, um, curvature that is so difficult that we work on uh, with the company courts now on the septum clip. Now we call it that you push on the septum and have a straight septum immediately. And hopefully these are, we have three, si three uh, thickness um, sizes. Now we have reduced it only to two uh, and have it with a mesh sh a shape so the mucosa can touch the cartilage and not cause any any problems of nutrition for the cartilage over time. Now I have a new, we still have time, a new chapter that I also want to discuss off-label use for the external nasal valve. Now uh, Mr. Waldner is smiling, that's, that's wonderful, uh, because the batten graft is the lateral wall that we want to help, not only the uh, internal nasal valve, but now we are working on the external nasal valve. This is from Peter Powell has his book, Beautiful Anatomic Des uh, Despictions, uh, where there is no support in that area. And what we do is we take the breathing plant as a flat plate again and fix it to the piriform aperture and have one part extend into the soft tissue of the nose towards the la lower lateral cartilage and sometimes connect it, sometimes not, but have it lateral to the lower lateral cartilage in that pocket. That's how it works. We usually take the largest one, bend it almost straight. You have to adapt it. It's, um, some patients need it completely straight, some need a little curvature. This is before and after. You see the effect you can get with dilatation of the external nasal valve. The cut is in the skin of the vestibule, not in the mucosa, this is skin. Then we prepare down to the piriform aperture. We expose the piriform aperture down there, and at the end, you should suture it, and there is no issue of healing problems, as you know, in the skin and the nose, this heals well. So let's look on the right side. This is the piriform aperture on the right side, and this is also the technique I now use to, to uh, resect the turbinate with that and, and chisel away part of the lacrimal bone over the lacrimal duct. Uh, for um, reduction of the turbinate. But this approach, we push away the peri periosteum laterally and then use a drill, two millimeter uh, drill diamond or sharper, doesn't matter, and make three burr holes. Then we put in sutures from the outside in. They, they have used proline sutures. I don't want this to move. I want this to remain in nose life long at this position. And we thread it through so the ends come out laterally from the bone. So we go in lateral to in the nose curve and come back out again. So both ends are lateral of the bone. And then we thread it through the implant and push it into the bot, into the pocket. And when it's in, you see this flange is into the nose. And you see how beautiful this works as an elastic spring. Cartilage cannot work like that, period. It cannot. Maybe it will at, at first, have a, some, some tension and structure. But we all know if you put cartilage in the sidewall, it tends to get weak. And after, in, with, with the time, 
it will not be able to hold. But this is a lifelong spring to hold the external uh, valve open. Here you see the drilling, drilling of the of the uh, of there, uh, the breathing plant what you put in, and the effect is tremendous before and after. Here on the other side. So this is an elastic dilatation. The patient does not feel it, but I have to warn the patient because it feels in that groove in the side of the nose. The nose will be a little bit wider here and he, the patient has to accept it. Visually, it's a little wider, especially for the first three, maybe six months. Afterwards, it will get less. He will not be, he will not be feeling it because it's, it's movable, but it will visually be a little bit wider. Because batten grafts from cartilage, as we, have, as we see here, they are not elastic, they just sit there. And this poor patient came to me from Germany. He had six surgeries or more to, for his nasal breathing problem. And what the surgeon did, he opened him up again and put another uh, graft in. Look at that disaster. See the scarring of the tip, the scarring of the sidewall. This sidewall had five layers of cartilage side by side. What a nonsense. I mean, this does not help. This does not pull out. This pushes it in. Any passive implant in the sidewall pushes in, not out. So if I may say, don't use cartilaginous batten grafts because they don't work. On one side, three layers. On the other side, five layers. So I dissected this all out. And then in this case, the question was, can you use several implants? Yes, we can. Oops. This is what, what we took out, this bulk of soft tissue in there. Uh, there you see the several layers of cartilage. And then we put not in not only a, a breathing implant on top, but also put a side uh, construction with two more implants on the side wall. And it's an improvisation, of course, of label use, Mr. Mertens, and, and, and fixed it there. And he was so happy breathing. He's, well, he is still swollen here. This is an early picture. He came from Dresden and didn't uh, come back afterwards. But as far as I know, he is doing well. Also, this gentleman that I oper operated on live in Kassel at the Rhino workshop of my dear colleague Stefan Maas, who had a collapse of the soft tissue of the lateral wall and felt it was too long, so we shortened it a little bit. But we also reconstructed his nasal dorsum with a metal bridge, if you want to say so breathing plant on the upper laterals and on the side walls connected to the breathing plant with two implants. So we'd have sufficient uh, stability of the side walls. And because the skin is so thick on the side wall here, it will never show or come out here, you know. So in all in all, I, we could say after these 18 years of experience that these titanium implants are fast, they work, uh, you don't need another donor site, no ear. Ear cartilage is too soft, don't use it in the nose. It, it doesn't work. Don't use it. If you use anything, use rib. I like to take rib, but if I can avoid it, I can spare half an hour or more of surgery. The patient doesn't have a scar, the patient doesn't have pain, and he is happy. And who is doing it? I was, uh, I was doing a course in, in South Africa. Many of my colleagues there very much appreciated now doing the surgery, uh, gave me feedback that they appreciated very much. Even uh, Professor Gubisch, who is a critical mind, I appreciate him very much, he's a good friend. He also tried it and found it helpful. There's a whole list of Nazim Cherkish, good surgeons and much many more who have used it. And Maybe Mr. Mertens remembers that. Maybe he was not in the company at that time, but 25 years ago for ear surgery, um, the standard was to use cartilage, to use maybe bone or, or plastic pore, plastic pore, Teflon, whatever was in, was a fashion then. And the Kurtz company was one of the first to use metal. And they were highly criticized for that. They started with gold implants first, and turned out that gold can, can cause granuloma reactions and cause deafness. So they, they stopped that and completely switched to titanium. And ever since, titanium is the gold standard in implants for the, for the ear, period. I mean, you all would agree there's nothing against it. And this is the, this, the clip piston that I invented some 25 years ago or so with a company that was modified to the soft clip and modified to the MVP clip. Uh, that I've been part of. And this is still used and it's working fine. 
So if titanium works in the ear that is so prone for infections, there is no reason why it should not work in a closed tissue like the nose. So to, to say take home messages from my side, uh, Mr. Wallner will give us his home, home take home messages as well, is it has been stable, reliable. It also works for me, also able use as a septum plate, as a baton graft. We do work on the septum clip. That will be a tremendous help once we have it and we wait for it so that we can use it. So for me, it's a pathway to happiness because of my patients. I don't become rich. Whatever I earn in money, I spend in travels for, for conferences. So I live in a small house. Don't worry, I'm not a rich man. This is a good sentence. Whenever somebody is criticizing you or, or uh, being uh, obnoxious, think that. It doesn't seem to be of intelligence. You have to be tolerant to other ideas. And if somebody doesn't like the idea of metal in the nose, fine be it. But it's unfortunate for the patient who don't get it because we also use it in thin skin patients like this Turkish lady uh, and the implant. As I said before, please come anytime we do surgery. Everybody is welcome. Uh, I love to have you. At, I, I do show you everything I know. I think we as experienced surgeons should teach the younger generation, all we know, we should not keep back with knowledge. When I was a young surgeon, my bosses didn't show me what they could because they wanted to keep the secrets to themselves. I'm just the opposite. I learned that when I was in America. I want everything that I know and learned over time to pass on. And I'm absolutely self-critical. With every of one of my surgery, I want to learn something more and I want to be better the next day. So it's a never ending learning curve for everything. And with that, I do end my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Before we go to Dr. Weiner, we have one question. Do you think, I mean, it's, <laughs> we are, we are we're still in the off -lay label use. Did you listen the titanium plate is suitable also for correcting of low dorsal augmentation instead of um, diced cartilage in, in fascia? or other techniques like rib graft? Never directly under the skin. No, no. It is much too dangerous that any kind of edge would break through. And I don't want that. I, I'm, I'm, I have been fighting for the safety of this idea of titanium in the nose. So please don't do that. Uh, I use free dice cartilage, I use dice cartilage in fascia, I use rib grafts as a whole piece or partial, um, use that, but please not, not metal in the nose, uh, in, in under the skin. Thank you. No further questions at the moment. I oh. think come to Dr. Weiner. Okay, I share my screen. We still have 119 participants. I'm happy. Thank you, participants, for being here today and for being open for this idea. Thank you. I congratulate you. Yeah, I also um, thank everybody for the patience. And uh, I just want to, to sum up a little bit. We have uh, taken a grand tour, I would say, through the nasal valve today, showing all uh, kinds of different aspects. and. The role that the breathe implant can play by widening the isthmus, um, the internal valve. And uh, so I would say my take home messages are those. Um, if you respect the correct indication, it's a straightforward implantation. If you have some um, rhinoplasty surgical experience, uh, also in my view, it's reliable and long term stable. Uh, it has an excellent biocompatibility and uh, you are independent of donor graft availability. Not always you have a septum available, for example, to make nice um, implants. You have no donor site morbidity and also in my experience, overall a high patient satisfaction. So I agree with uh, Professor Wengen that this method deserves more attention and um, that everybody who's active on this field should add it to his toolbox. That's my five cent. <laughs> Fully agree. Thank you. And we should say 
um, Dr. Wallner and I, we met virtually for the first time here. We didn't even meet before. Uh, and so we are completely unbiased. Would you agree to that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think um, we are close to end. Um, we have no further questions. And um, we would like to thank to all participants and especially to you, Professor Weiner and Professor Aveng for the ex excellent presentations. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact us. And um, just one last question, which is dropping in again. We've answered it before. Yes, we try to make a recording available and everybody who participated um, will um, get an email from us with a link. And, and we also try to put it on YouTube, at least part of it, so you can look it up there as well. Yes. One last remark from the audience, please send the coffee receipt. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a good statement um, for the end. Again, <laughs> thanks a lot and um, we will stay in touch and hopefully we can, we can um, make the next session soon. And um, thanks a lot to everybody for the time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.